if you have your Bible, uh, you can just pull it out. Maybe we'll get to uh, look in there a little bit today. Uh, there are some passages that I'm going to base all this stuff off on that, that are important, and sometimes we should be looking in there to see what it says, because uh, I could just tell you it says a bunch of stuff, but does it say that? Um, you know, a lot of the problem with Christianity today is that we've adopted a faith. We just took somebody else's, and we said, okay, I'll just take some of that, uh, like it's like a serving, like a buffet line or something, and, and the truth is, is that nothing, you always hear about personal relationship because nothing can really add up to personal relationship. You know, the disciples sort of just, it wasn't like Jesus, like, you have to do what I tell you. Like, he never really does anything. He's not forceful with them ever. Uh, and, and everybody's always contrasting them and what they were doing with the law. And, and I think the understanding among him and his disciples was, it's not about keeping the law. It's just about responding to the person that loves you. And Jesus just gives himself away over and over again to these guys. And it's just, it's just a response to, like, this sacrificial love. And, uh, and so it pulls at our hearts. And so it's really important that we feel that personally and we experience that personally. I remember years ago a friend of mine talking about how he didn't believe in God at all. And then in a closet, in a moment of desperation, he prays that God would reveal himself to him and all of his friends. And within a week, like five of his friends had called them with amazing stories of personal dynamic like interaction with God and he's like well I guess God's real because there's just nothing that can substitute for experience you can I can tell you what the Eiffel Tower is like and climbing on it and everything you've seen a thousand pictures of but you got to go and you got to see it and you got to drink wine on the lawn and watch it get dark at night and whatever and smell the smells of Paris and you just have to do that and like you could just describe everything about it all the facts of it and all this architectural design and how long it took them to make it and everything but a kid can know more if they went and experienced it than you could and all that knowledge and so all this stuff is knowledge all this stuff is important but I just want to encourage you hopefully all this will do is make you hungry and thirsty to get in this Bible and I promise you the more that you get into this Bible the more that it'll get into you and a lot of people don't get that because but they never tried it it says, taste and see the Lord is good. You, you got, everybody's got kids. I'm like, come on, man, Pastor. Like, just, just taste it. I promise you, you're like, no, no, not going to do it, Dad. Not going to do it. I'm like, but it's so good for you. That's the worst thing you could say. You know, like, it's healthy. It's good for you. It doesn't matter. Taste and see. No, not going to do it. And that's the way a lot of us, we are with God. We're like, I know it's probably good for me. I know it's probably going to help me. But I just don't even want to taste it because I don't even think I'm going to like it. Because in downloaded into us from Genesis chapter 3 is this mistrust for God. And what we decided is, well, God, I don't really think I can believe you. I don't really, I can't really think I can trust you. In fact, I'm going to trust everything else except for you. And it's this disposition that just stays within us. We're constantly saying, I just don't think I can trust you in my life, God. I just don't think I can trust you with my heart, God. I just don't think I can trust you in my marriage. I don't think I can trust you in my kids. I don't think I can trust you in my future. I don't think I can trust you in my finances. I don't think I can trust you with my life. Like, I need to keep it for me. And, uh, and so God sits out, and we let him sit out. And uh, I think when we dare each other to trust each other a little more, when we dare each other, we see somebody that's, like, really activated in their faith, and they're exercising their faith. We're like, wow, like, it works. Or we hear a prayer that's answered. Somebody, somebody's prayer is answered. You're like, wow, like, God answered a prayer, like, as if we were surprised. Uh, but are we praying and are we asking for that kind of stuff? I heard of this evangelist, and uh, it was really kind of arrogant what he said. He said, well, what happens when you go to a place and, and it's dead? Nothing's happening. He's, you, what do you mean? The Holy Spirit's not doing anything. It's just a dead room. He goes, well, I make, if the Holy Spirit's not moving. I make him move. And people are like, you make God move, huh? It's arrogant. He said, well, yeah, the Holy Spirit's not moving. I make him move. Well, how do you do that, sir? By faith. I start exercising faith right there, and then the Holy Spirit starts moving because he only works in accordance to faith. It's really smart if you think about it. It sounds really simple, but it is simple. And so much of this stuff is not complex, but it's very simple, but it's, not, it's, been, uh, it's been lacking. And, and the reason why it's wanting is because it hasn't been tried. It hasn't been, it hasn't been given an opportunity. We haven't tasted and seen. We haven't prayed uh, with faith. The same guy thought that it was right to pray once, pray once 
Ask God for what you need. He says, ask and be given unto you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. It doesn't say ask a certain way or ask real specifically or if you've done everything right and you've made all the right decisions this week and if you've gone to church, then you can ask for whatever you need and I'll give it to you. It doesn't say that at all. It says, whatever you ask in my name, believing, you'll receive it. So ask once. If you ask twice, then what are you doing? If you ask a third time, if you ask a fourth time, and then did you believe the first time? Are you still wrestling in unbelief? See, prayer once is faith. Prayer twice could be considered unbelief. Now, that's all good and free. So, uh, so if you need to hear that, that's for you today. Think about the world. Because I, I, I feel like this is important. I want, I want to talk about this today. I want you to think about our world. And I want you to think about being a disciple and why that would be relevant, why that would be important at all for you today. Have you noticed, when's the last time you've gone out in creation? You know, you, my dad was a forester. So, like, he went and every day he worked in the woods. And so, like, I would want to go hunting or something, and my dad's like, no, son, we ain't going to the woods on Saturday. I ain't, I'm not going. And uh, so, so I would want to go hunt, and he, he would just want to walk, to, uh, walk uh, boundary lines and stuff, and every once in a while, he'd make me paint, paint boundary lines with him and bring a sack lunch and leave me in the woods by myself. And I knew right then I didn't ever want to be a forester, ever, okay? And uh, it, it just doesn't pay, you know? It's like farming. or It's a lot of work, and you hope it works out. But... Uh, but my dad did give me this great appreciation for nature. And he, he, my dad to this day, don't put any bug spray on me. Whatever it does to those bugs, it's doing that to you too. He's just very natural about things. And he just put in me this, this, this appreciation for, for natural things. And, 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 you know, I would want to go out and, and shoot, my, shoot birds. And my dad, you know, I'm a little kid with a BB gun, you know. God made those birds, you know. And, and, and when I was like wanting to deer hunt all the time, he sat me down. He said, son, I wanted to deer hunt too one day. And my, my dad took me out and I shot a deer and I killed it. And then I went up to it and he said, and it broke my heart. And he said, I cried. And I said, I'm never going to do that again. And not everybody's that way. You know, it's fine. I'm not saying that we have to be that way. But, but he had an appreciation for nature. And, and the more that he sort of was that way and sensitive to that, the more that it, it inspire me. And just by the way, to me, that is what love is, is sensitivity, is seeing and being sensitive to what is in front of you, not what it used to be and judging or what it could become and it's all potential and not how it benefits you, but just what that is, why it's there, and to see that and to notice that for what it is and to pay attention, right, and to be sensitive to that is to allow love. And you can't see things if you're not sensitive to them, if you're not even trying to understand them, then you can't love. I don't care how good your feelings are or anything. The more we pay attention, the more that we value and, and look at things, the more that we can really love them because understanding is the basis for all care or for love. So think about this world and creation. And next time, you need to go out. You, somebody, if, if you've got a place where you can go and walk some land, go and walk some land. Go and look at, at something small. Go Go and notice the flowers. Or go and no, because that's what Jesus is doing. He's giving these analogies and stuff where they're walking outside. Well, consider the lilies of the field or consider the birds of the air, okay? He's like, they don't even worry about it, and God's taking care of them. And God, so Jesus is using these horticultural examples and these farming examples and the seed and the, the soil and the vineyard. They're all about the God's creation. And so he was finding little case studies everywhere in nature, and that's the way it's supposed to be with us, okay? All right. You don't have to know, like, let's think about this, okay? Everything we know about God is right here. But most of the world was illiterate for most of all human history, and the Bible wasn't even around for most of it, okay? So we can read now, but once upon a time, people couldn't read. But how is the God is going to get his gospel to all these masses of people that don't know? Well, it's creation. It says all the things about God are clearly seen, being understood by things that are made. In fact, I'll read that to you right now in Romans chapter 1. Listen, let's give it out here so we understand it, okay? Um, the wrath of God, now it sounds bad, but just listen in between the lines. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of all people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known of God is plain to them because God has made it plain to him, 
How has God made himself and his presence plain to people? For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly seen being understood by the things that have been made so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. And all they, though they claimed to be wise, they became fools and they exchanged the glory of God for the, of a moral God for images to make look like mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gives them up to all sorts of trouble. So it says the, the, the eternal qualities of God are, are understood and clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made so that we're all without excuse. So you can look at nature and you can see God. You can experience God. You can know about your existence. You can know about the world that we live in just based on the obvious clues that are in nature. Now, so, so, so for instance, go look at a tree. I mean, that sounds dumb, but like that tree started from an acorn, man. That's a miracle. Did you know that? It's a miracle. It started with an acorn, and it grew into this tree, and a tree is the largest plant on the earth, okay? But do you know that tree does all kinds of stuff for us? You know, in parts of the world where they need the wood and they keep cutting it down, all this deforestation was causes drought because the tree, like, is part of what cycles. It creates rain and, and, and all this stuff. It, it holds in all this carbon, this, all this stuff that it does, and I'm not a big uh, biological person. It stabilizes the soil for us. It gives us oxygen, all right? Uh, it, it basically gives us shelter. When we cut the wood down, we use it for all sorts of things. It's just a tree. Or consider like a bee. You know that like 70% of all of the food that we can eat comes because bees pollinate. And if they didn't pollinate, we wouldn't have any food. And if you go and you just start to consider any part of any ecology, any, any system, you're going to find something really interesting. You're going to find God in this picture of God and his handprint on all this stuff. And here's what, I'm, what you'll see. You won't just see this bee. You'll see this bee and how this bee does this and how this bee doing this helps all this other stuff do this and does this. And it goes all the way up until where those bees are essential because it's like this interdependent thing. It's this ecosystem where everything has its right place. And there is a created order, right? A created order. Scientists to just go out, man, and they do all these hypotheses. And what are they looking for? They're looking for patterns. And every once in a while, they're astounded because their hypotheses were wrong. And the pattern is even more brilliant and more interesting and more phenomenal than they could ever imagine. And never in the time of the history of the human beings have we ever known more about things like, like molecular structure, like down to the smallest I iota of things. The deeper you look into things, the more there's pattern of God. There's more there's like purpose, right? The more that there's all this stuff working together to make sense. It's an ordered universe, right? So you can see that, and I can see that. But today, in our world, it's not that way, is it? See, we went from this thing called modernity or modernism where the modern man, modern thought, we build our ideas based on logic. We look at the order of things and we order those things. And we're order makers. We're like God because God took black, water, nothing, chaos. And he took that chaos and he created order in seven days, right? He makes order out of all these things and all these things work together. It says on the sixth day, beheld everything that he made. He looked at everything. He and, 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 and what, the, what, the, what the original language shows there is that like, he looks at it and can't find anything else to do to it because it's totally perfect. There's no other work he could do. It's, it's completely perfect in every way. It takes care of itself, and there's this ecosystem, and it's taking care of itself. And even death and different stuff end up being a part of that, okay? And so this beautiful picture of God creating chaos, taking chaos and, and, and making order out of it, okay? So we have this modern thought, but now we've turned into postmodern, okay? And I know that's weird stuff, and we don't have to get into that too much. But nowadays, people don't really believe there's an ordered world. They think there's a disordered world, and then there's just chaos everywhere. 
and that there is no truth anywhere, and that everything is relative, and your truth is your truth, and my truth is my truth, and I'm going to take from a web of different places and a web of different sources, and, I'm, and even they talk about investing these days. Millennials are investing with no fundamentals, just investing in anything they like, just because a, a figurehead says to invest in it. They're like, okay, no fundamentals, it doesn't matter. And so even jokes are getting huge, like even these cryptocurrencies that are were considered jokes are making lots of money because they're realizing that that there's no fundamentals. And I'm not saying that that's us, but younger people tend to be this way. And we're growing up in a postmodern world where there is no order, where there is no rhyme or reason to things. But how did we get that way? And what's up with that? And is God a God of disorder? Is God a God of chaos? Is he just like embrace the chaos, man? It doesn't make any difference. Let the tornadoes spin. Let it all just be crazy. All right, do whatever you want to. We don't need law and order. We don't need any rules. We don't need any accountability. In fact, just do whatever you want in every way you want to because there's no order. It doesn't make any sense. Isn't it interesting that we, scientific minds and smart people, and any of us, big or small, little kids or adults, we can go out and look at any iota of nature and we can see, we can discern clearly, all right, that it's, a, that it's an ordered universe, that it's part of a larger scenario. But isn't it curious that the only beings that can discern that there's a created order to the whole cosmos decide that there is no created order and that we're not a part of anything like that. That there is no meaning and there is no truth and it really doesn't matter what we do. Isn't it curious that we can in one hand hold order and see it so clearly, but then in the next minute say, but but there is no order and there is only nothing and meaning is just what we make of it and all this is just randomness because that is what the world is looking like today, isn't it? And that's what the world is talking about. And the men just going on with new ideas and new things. We just get smarter and smarter and keep thinking how we know better than God. And how, you know, it's just whatever it needs to be. And and the problem is, is that we can't get our heads around it. The problem is we can't explain it. Or the problem is, is that we don't want to deal with it. Is that we don't want to deal with it. That Romans passage we just read said that things have been clearly understood so that they are without excuse. So if you know of a created order and you know that the whole world works a certain way like it's supposed to in a system, all right, and you are made in the image of God to be a part of that system to steward this whole created order, all right, then why would you be interested in deciding that it doesn't matter, that it's not an order to it, that it only should be chaos and like crazy, you know, whatever kind of living? What would make you decide that that is how it should be? It would be you not wanting to be responsible and me not wanting to be responsible. Because if there's a system and a created order and you don't like that system and created order, then you just have to decide that that system and created order is wrong or that you're not going to be a part of it. But everything in the whole cosmos is created order. It's clear. And so we can tell that our existence There's some version of order that's required of our existence. And there's something about God that's very orderly and exact. And there's something about God that's random and beautiful. And there's something about God that embraces imperfection. It's all there, too, in nature. Every tree is different. They're all perfectly different. None of them exactly alike. They're all perfectly, uniquely different. You and I are all the same, and we're all very uniquely and perfectly different. And there's no perfect person except for Jesus. And even his appearance wasn't that great. All right, and his track record for success in the terms of the world, not that great. All right, he's still perfect. And so we can still be perfect in this created order. But there seems to be dissonance because in our day and age, if you listen to the talking heads and you listen to the ways of this world, they're just saying what doesn't matter. And it's not, there is no order. It's all just randomness. It doesn't make any difference. And we're pushing towards a society that has no boundaries. And we all know it's not good, don't we? Like, we all know, like, you can only take that so far. It's, it's going to be chaos. And is that what we really, really want? And so my question or my point today to make is, we, are we wanting to join in God's order? Because to me, if we're going to be disciples of Jesus, we're going to be disciples of, of Jesus we're going to do what Jesus wanted to do. We're going to do, be a, a part of what God's heart is. And God is a God of order, not chaos. Now, God's not afraid of chaos. 
He's bigger than chaos, but he wants to bring order, okay? And Jesus comes, all right, and what's he do? He's setting things straight. You think that you've heard it said that God's this way, but, but look, God's not like that. God's like this. He's setting things straight. Hey, Jewish people, y'all thought you're supposed to follow the law and all these things, and we've had all these commands for thousands of years. But I'm telling you, the way that you're going to keep those commands is by loving. Freely you've received, freely give. That's going to be the way that it works. All right? And he's bringing order to the chaos. And so it is that for all of our lives, for everything in our lives, that God's desire is for there to be order. Not control, like not like weird stuff, but everything in its right place. Don't you crave that? Don't you desire that? And see, the other thing, the chaos, is what brings anxiety on us and brings fear and brings all sorts of unknowns. And so I think that like fundamentally, this is my simple message today, fundamentally, God is a God of order. And when you invite God into your life, that is what he wants to do in your life. And that's not wrong. There's no Enneagram personality type that's excused from going from chaos to order. There's no family that wouldn't benefit from going from chaos to order or like any situation that wouldn't benefit from going from chaos to order. See, it says in 1 Corinthians 14, 33, for God is not a God of disorder, but of order. No, but of peace. And see, how can you be at peace? The way that you're at peace is when everything's in order. I mean, Celsi prayed for rest earlier. How can you be at rest when you've done the good work and the work is done? But if you look for rest all week and that's all you did, you're not going to find any rest because you don't have anything to rest in. The rest comes after the work. You rest in the work done. You rest in the chaos created and made into order. And you feel good about that. When you take your yard and, you, and it's all growing up and everything and then you work all day and it's hard work and you bring that thing into order and you rest well. You're at peace there. You've done what your father in heaven did, which is you took that garden and you tended it and you did what you were supposed to do and you made good work of it and you brought it into order. And guess what? That good work produces something. It produces in you a satisfaction, but it produces more than that. It produces food. And it just keeps going on and on and on. And so to me, this gives us a little bit of purpose for our lives because look, your life and my life are not good. Like, it's a mess, right? Yours, I mean, maybe yours is less, less a mess than mine or more than a mess. It doesn't matter. God's ideas and God's purposes for us are the same today, yesterday, and forever. And he wants to come in and bring peace and order to our lives. He wants to take the chaos and say, look, you don't have to worry about it. And maybe even there's chaos all around you. But it says that he'll keep you in perfect peace, right, inside if we're paying attention to him, if we're showing up. To him. Now, what are we supposed to do as disciples in the world? We are supposed to be order makers. We're supposed to, look, the disciples didn't have everything. They didn't have and nothing, okay? They didn't even, there was no seminary education. All they did was do what they saw and, and heard Jesus doing. And, when after, and after Jesus uh, dies and is resurrected, it goes on, then they really kick into what they're supposed to do. But what do they do? They confront the issues of the day. They confront the situations of the day. And they say, this is, this is not what God is doing. God is creating order in this place. God has, wants a church to be built, and it's going to be organic, and it's going to come out of the ground. It's become one of the most important things in the world. And guess what? They all thought they were crazy, but that's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened. But they were order makers. Jesus was an order maker. Jesus would come into a town. The whole town's messed up. You got people that's, that are this way and that way, lame and sick and hurting. He goes around and goes everywhere that's asked, and he just heals, and he creates order. He brings back reconciliation and order, and he brings a peace, shalom of God everywhere that he goes. And by the way, peace or shalom of God is an all-encompassing peace. So it doesn't mean you have a tranquil feeling in your heart. The shalom of God meant everything would be at peace, and mostly economical, because a lot of uh, our lives are economical. And when God could bring uh, peace to the chaos and order to that chaos, is where you start to trust God with your stuff. And you try to trust God with the consequences of what you mean. Because this is our birthright, friends. Our God is a God that created order out of chaos. He wants to create order out of chaos in our lives. And this is what we're supposed to do as disciples. We're to go out and tell what the truth is and say, no, 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 no. I'm sorry. It sucks, but men can't really be Men or women, and women can't really be men. You know what I mean? Like, like 
we can all act like the emperor ain't got any clothes on, but women are women. And, and, and I know there's tr that stuff is funny today. And, and maybe there's room in all of that, and we have to love. But I think we also have to say, hey, this seems mighty chaotic. This doesn't seem grounded in anything. It doesn't seem true. And that is the only time where we should judge. We have to make judgments about the world. We have to make judges about the situations that we're in. You have to make judgment is just a choice, a distinction. This guy's a good mayor. This guy's not a good mayor. This is the reason why. This government can't keep doing what it's doing because this is the reason why. Look what it's done. Look at the history of everything that's happened before. We can't keep doing this. It's not sustainable. That's just voice of reason. That's just truth. And my question is, who are the truth tellers of, of today? Who are the truth tellers? Are we waiting on somebody else? Are you waiting on somebody else to create order for you? Are you waiting on somebody else to create order in this town? Because the Christians are supposed to be stewards of truth. We're supposed to have all uh, of what has been given, all right? And as we have freely received, so we should freely give. And my question is, would you just wish chaos on your neighbors? Would you just wish chaos on this city? Would you just wish chaos on all this culture? You know, a lot of times it's what Christians do. We get mad and we're like, you know, yeah, they just go ahead and let them run off the cliff. We are all mad at them. Well, that ain't going to help nobody. Never going to help anybody. I think I've been thinking about the maternal qualities, you know, this weekend of God. Because God is both male and female. Or not, or the above. Like, I don't want to get into any logical things with anybody. But in this image of God, he created them male and female. He created them, okay? And so that's why we're really interested in the other sex. Because that's the other side of God's heart that you don't have. And so you want that. And you like that, and, you, and it's eternally like this thing. And that's a beautiful picture of God, right? So, but, but there's this motherliness of God. And you think about, like, dad was like, I'm going to take you behind the woodpile, son, and it's not going to be good. Mom would just be like, you're breaking my heart. It was always this, this, this and, 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 and it didn't matter the chaos. She could always bring some order to that. She could always bring some peace and some comfort to that. Gather in the chicks, you know, like gather you up. Never judged you. Always loved you. What love? Paying attention, caring, being tenderhearted. And that motherliness of God is there. And I just imagine God as mother uh, wanting so much to redeem people unto himself. Wanting so much. To break his heart being broken at the chaos and, and, the, and the lies and the deception at mass scales that's happened in our world. And he say, man, my people should do something about that. My spirit is grieved, should do something about that. What could we ever do about that? Jesus' plan is he took 12 ordinary men, and he taught them, and he walked with them. And then he, and then he let them go, and they became great people in their, in their world, in their generation. He wants to do the same thing with us. As we consider what it means to be disciples of Jesus, and, and look, you don't have to, we don't have to come up with new, some new idea. Look in creation. Look in your word, right? Understand that love is really basically all that we have to do, and we have to pay attention and be fully present, and we just have to be people of truth. Jesus says, sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. In fact, in John 17, he says, for their sake, I sanctify myself. Over and over and over again in Jesus' life, all he did was he sanctified himself. Well, sanctify just means set yourself apart or be set apart or be made holy or be made perfect, all right? Be holy as I am holy is what the Bible says. So be perfect as I am perfect. Seems kind of crazy, all right? But Jesus, he goes around, he sanctifies himself. Well, he's already clean. He never done anything wrong. So why is Jesus sanctifying himself? For our sake, for our sake. And so that ends up being our opportunity to serve the world around us when we sanctify ourselves, when we set ourselves apart, when we say, you know what? I have to reject that cultural artifact right there. I have to reject that piece of culture right there because that goes against the truth of God's word. It goes against the natural created order of things. It goes against everything in our existence and we can't keep turning a blind eye to it. And you can... Make whatever judgments you want about it. 
But it seems to me the way that we lie to, we're the only creatures, by the way, that can actually lie to ourselves and do things that are bad for us knowingly, and we just keep doing it. The only creatures that are that way. Look, a dog, he doesn't know it's bad for himself, right? right, like, right, right like they just don't have that moral uh, potential, that, that moral capacity, but we do. And we can lie to ourselves and tell each other lies over and over again. But all that comes from, it's nothing complex. It's no new, psycho, interesting, weird thing that's come out because of, it's in our water, okay? It's just that we don't, we're just deny responsibility. We just don't want to have to be responsible for being ordered, we just don't want to be responsible for saying, oh, man, if I admit that there's an ordered world, that I have to find my place in that. I have to cooperate un- underneath that created structure. And what we'd rather do is say, no, 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 I want the world to be my way. And I want it to, to revolve around me. And I want it to serve my needs. And so I'm going to deny truth here and here and here and where it's ever convenient for me so that I can be justified in my existence and not have to have a God. And so Genesis 1, all the way through, It's a very, very simple thing. And human beings, right, we have a choice, a choice towards order or towards chaos. And like all over the different ways the Bible says it. It says like, today I'm set before you blessings or curses. And he says that in Deuteronomy. It's like, if if you follow the mind, if you love the Lord your God, all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, if you follow all his commands, and if if you do, then it's going to go well with you. It's going to go well with your children. And like, and your, and your land is going to be blessed and everything you do is going to be blessed. But it's like, but if you don't love the Lord your God, if you don't walk in his ways, if you decide you don't want to follow him, then you're going to be cursed. And every day is going to be hard. And the sweat on your brow is going to continue to increase and it's going to fall on your children and on your children's children's children. Because you did not do what the Lord your God asked and required of you, which was to simply love him, which is to follow his commandments. And we know in the Old Testament that following his commandments is all considered negative. Thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, right? But then Jesus comes and gives positive to all the commandments. The whole, all the commands can be summed up in this, to love God with all your heart and to love your neighbor as yourself. And he says, in fact, all the world will know that you're my disciples, right, if you have love for one another. And so our simple Uh, command is to love, to love the world, all right, to love things. And one, we can can love by paying attention, but we can love by bringing order to chaos. we, We can be like God when we can know truth and disseminate truth in a way that is loving and caring and out of goodwill, out of good heart, out of a good desire. And guess what, friends, when we're doing that, that little piece of real estate, suddenly becomes God's kingdom again, where God rules. Because kingdom is just where God, a king rules. So when your house comes back in and when you repent and you start following God's ways, then, then, then peace is brought on that house and order is brought to that house. And in that sp- small part of the world, it's been redeemed. And then everywhere that you go, you start to preach that, not by having to say anything, just by the fact that your life is good. And people say, well, why is it good? And what do you have and how can you be this way? And why do you do things just because it's good? Why do you pick up trash just because it's good? Like what's making you be good just to be good? Well, love. Well, love. Well, how do you know what love is? Well, we don't know what love is. Well, the only reason we know what love is because he first loved us, right? And so we're only giving what God has given to us. We're only trying to give the world what we also want, which is acceptance and order in the midst of chaos. And here's the thing. We can wait on God, but it ain't going to happen, all right? God's plan is me and you. If you're going to be Christian today and you say, well, God's going to have to do it. It's too big of a wheel for me to turn. Um, I'm just going to kind of embrace the chaos. That's a flippant way of being. That's an apathetic way of being. I'm afraid I've, 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 I've done that. I've been that way. It has not gotten me anything. Apathy has not gotten me anything anything. And it just cannot be the way that God intended it. And so that's all I have. Uh, We got five minutes and uh, we'll be done. I don't know uh, what that can mean for you, except that I think on a very base level, we can take our problems, our concerns, our issues, the turmoil of our innermost being, and we can trust God with that stuff, okay? And, And it might not happen today. It might take a little while. The mess you've made, it might take a little while. But God will pull you out of that mess. In fact, he probably already has. 
And all you need to do to strengthen your faith today and make him move today is remember what he did for you once upon a time. And say, man, after all God's done for me this time and this time, I'm not going to start doubting him now because he's not going to leave me today. Just as he had done it a thousand times before, he can do it again. He can take your life, the mess you got right now, and he can start to bring order there and peace there. And that, friends, is worth having. That's worth everything. What good is a man to gain his whole world but forfeit his own soul? Like what we need is our souls to be intact and our souls to be at, in harmony with the created universe around us. And to me, that's what Jesus does. He puts all things back together, right? Reconciling all things to himself in heaven and on earth, everything. Reconciling all things to himself. That's what it says in Colossians. And so we're just his ambassadors. We're just preaching that same reconciliation that's happened to us to others. But let's not trade in our birthright, friends. Let's not, let's not quit being salty. Because if you quit being salty, you can't be salty again. Like the salt is different, and that's what makes it affect change. The light is different than the darkness. All right? And the darkness couldn't comprehend it. Why? Because it's different. It's when we let our light shine, and we become salty again, and we're different, and we show the contrast, right? Then we become more relevant than we've ever been. Because people see an alternative, right, to Babylon, to the wide road that leads to destruction that most everybody goes down according to the words of Jesus. But this narrow way that few find that has life, we're stewards of that. And our witness and our words and our lives and how that works out, we're witnesses to that. And I think we deny that and I think we play into the world and its games, we're going to get burned over and over and over again. And I'm tired of getting burned. And I'm only here to say I'm trying my best, and I need you, and you need me, and we need each other to preach to one another the truth and to tell each other that we love each other or to tell each other we're wrong about stuff and to make sure that, that, that we all have each other's backs because we need each other's faith. And so that's why we meet together, and that's why we take communion. That's why we worship. That's why we pray together. That's why we read the Bible because we've got to stay with it because Things are continuously whispering different ways. Things are continuously telling us other things. I mean, just think about it. The influence that you give is usually how much time you spend, and the average person is spending three to five hours a day on their phone. So, like, if your kids are doing that, that means they're being discipled by kids YouTube, by the way. iCarly is discipling my girls because they're getting hours of it, all right, hours of it every day. And so we're just in a world where there's so much noise that, of course, everybody's deciding, well, it doesn't matter. None of it matters anymore. We're overwhelmed. We're just all overwhelmed, and we're all just, just feel like there's just no hope. There's no chance. And I don't know. I keep looking at this Bible, and it seems like the heart of God is to bring some order out of us. Let me pray, and we'll be done. Today, I just thank you, God, that you're a God of order. You've given us free will. You've given us some minds, and we get crazy with our minds and our thinking, God. We're like sheep, and sheep stay with other sheep, and sheep are concerned about what other sheep are getting, and sheep are selfish, and sheep are kind of idiots, but you love us, and you say you're our shepherd, and you say your sheep will hear your voice. You also said that other other imposters will come and they'll try to get us away and to steer us towards other pastures. And so, Father, you're just warning us that there's danger. Like a good father, you're just telling us, don't hurt yourself. Don't hurt yourself. Listen to me. Trust me. So I just ask, God, that you would help us make the decision or the commitment right now that we all desire, because we all desire order. We all desire peace. Just ask that you would give us uh, hearts that repent and reconsider and we'll go back to your word that is sure. You say the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of God will stand forever. And so we just want to, to come back to that, to return to our first love and to ask you, God, to bring order in our lives, bring order in our families and in our situations and our business, bring order to our, to our city, God, and to this country, Father, and to this world, as things continue to move in whatever direction, we know that you're in charge, but we know that you have a heart 
for the lost, and you have a heart for the world. And, and so give us that same heart. Um, I'm just asking for you to renew us, Lord. Renew each one of us in our commitments to you. We love you, and we need you. And we just confess that all in Jesus' name. Amen.